gone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yep. That and we're now okay. recording. And um, that's it. So again, let me know if you have any questions in the chat throughout. And uh, this is a teaching and learning with primary sources, part one, special collections and university archives with Kathleen Smith and Stacy Krim. Thank you very much. Hello, all. Um, welcome. Um, I'm just a quick Quick introduction. My name is Kathleen Smith, and I am Instruction Outreach Archivist at the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collection and University Archives. I'm also serving as interim head right now. And my illustrious colleague, Stacy Krim, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I am the curator of the Manuscripts Collection and the Cello Music Collection in UNCG Special Collections and University Archives. Okay, just to give you an idea, we have a rich variety of collections that we pull into our class instruction, and this is kind of how we are organized. We have university archives, um, and those are collections that are generated by the university. So we hold um, all departmental records, we hold um, historic images, textiles, artifacts, oral histories, basically anything that is generated by the university, we are required to keep, and we pull those into our um, set. Sessions. We have special collections, which include rare books, published material, um, and cello music. Actually, we have the largest cello music uh, score collection in the world. Um, we have manuscripts, which Stacy curates, including unpublished materials, personal papers, scrapbooks, diaries, a lot of really wonderful material. Um, preservation services. So actually, our wonderful colleagues who take care of not only the million plus books in our library, but they also take care of um, the special collections material. So we're very lucky to have them within our department as well. And last but not least, we have a great women veterans collection, which includes oral histories, textiles, diaries, correspondence, um, uniforms from women in the military from First World War to current conflicts. So this is kind of the, a lot of our um, kind of the, the way we organize our material in special collections. And surprisingly, these are um, kind of some of the programs and departments of the classes that we teach. And you may be surprised at, at the variety of them, even kinesiology. So uh, we teach courses um, or class sessions in uh, all of these uh, areas. And I just I wanted to bring in the guidelines um, for primary source literacy and specifically because I believe Maggie Murphy is going to speak about the framework for information literacy in part two of this series. And these guidelines were created because of the recognition of the growing importance of teaching with primary sources. And this is not only in college classes, but also in K through 12 classes as well. Therefore, the guidelines were created by the Society of American Archivists. Um, as well as the Association for College and Research Libraries as kind of a pedagogical structure for teaching with primary source material, kind of best practices. And so I wanted to kind of mention that too, because we do go by these when we teach class, sections, class sessions. And it's really interesting because it coincides with, with kind of multiple literacies. So it's not only primary source literacy that we consider, but it's the way it coincides with all different kinds of literacy. Um, information literacy, primary source literacy, but also visual literacy, media literacy, cultural literacy. And these are all different literacies that we consider when we are teaching these class sessions. And we use these literacies to kind of create um, a, a kind of a larger way of looking at things for the students, kind of different perspectives. And we always tell them that as many primary sources as they can kind of use for their research and writing the better. And often we equate it, equate it with a jigsaw puzzle because a lot of them have either worked on a jigsaw puzzle or seen a jigsaw puzzle. And we say, just like a jigsaw puzzle, the, the, and if you equate the, the, the different resources with the pieces, the many, as many as you can get together, you can begin to see the picture better. And this is always a good way to kind of explain that to the students. The kind of sessions that we offer 
um, we, uh, we do all different kinds of things and we work really closely with the faculty to tailor it to the best the, kind of the, the way that their class works. So we do Zoom sessions relating to topics covered in class. We've done a lot of those, as you can imagine, during um, COVID. We go into classes and give presentations uh, relating to the, the class topics. Um, and we also encourage classes to visit us in the archives. Um, when we do presentations there, we do pop-up displays of material from our archival collections. We like to incorporate um, primary source evaluation exercises when we do this using um, material from um, all different collections that we might have. A lot of times the professors will um, incorporate our material into some kind of a project. A lot of them are kind of in-depth projects where the students have to come back and use material. Um, a lot of times these projects will not will use not only our physical uh, material, but they will also incorporate some of our um, digitized material, our online resources. And these projects can also um, be collaborative with other librarians um, in our library. For example, we work closely with um, several of our ROI librarians or other library departments. Um, one of the things that's great about about use, kind of coming to the archives is that we have so many great collections and that really engage students. And here are some examples on the screen. We have some wonderful things that, and you know, sometimes students might be a little bit intimidated about coming into the archives because you walk into the reading room and it looks a little bit like a, a living room. But it's great to have material out that really engages students as they come in. Here's some examples that we've had out of kind of pop-up displays um, a, for a pottery class, um, for just a general class. You see the, the McKeever's death mask there, which students absolutely love. And we also have a Washington Press you see below um, where students can actually have a hands-on experience with a printing press. Stacey, please pop in anytime you'd like to. Um, we do the same thing with rare books and manuscripts as much as 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 much as we can get students to have a hands on experience with our material, the better. And it's so interesting because a lot of times we have to actually say, please touch it, touch this, um, because they sometimes can be a little a bit intimidated by the material. And, um, you know, they for some reason they think, oh, you know, we, we, we are not allowed to touch this, but there's nothing that we bring out that those students cannot touch. Um, so we do a lot of different things and it and it really kind of spans uh, you know everything it, it depends on what type of class we're having because we'll have anything from a freshman class to a graduate seminar we kind of do it all for example if we're having some a, a freshman class come in or a sophomore class that just wants to come in quickly uh, we may have something simple like a, a world war ii poster something like this where it has um, a simple primary source analysis exercise where you have um, a soldier to the left saying if you go if you tell where he's going he may never get there um, and we have the student look at this talk about you know, who the audience is, who created it, when it was created, as opposed to on the right, where it's again, the same theme, loose lip sync ships, but someone talked. And they really enjoy this. This is a simple exercise um, that they really enjoy. And then we usually have some kind of analysis or assessment where they can go through and talk about um, how to observe it, um, how to contextualize it, um, and how to use it in their research or writing. We also just, Stacey and I thought it might be interesting just to show y'all some different ways that we use our material in different classes. Um, this is a photography class. So they might come into the, to our um, uh, Hodges reading room and we would have a pop-up display. This one has some great old cameras and images that we have that the students could look at and that we could kind of teach with. And there it is. So if you see in the, in the back, that is a, a, a room that the part of this room is used for presentations. And then we have the pop up exhibit. This is also a great room that we use for um, exhibits as well. And then we walk into the researcher room where we have a primary source evaluation exercise set up. And you can see here there is we have evaluation um, uh, documents set up. And then we also have photographs that they can choose and look through and do a little bit um, more deep dive analysis. 
We've also done a really interesting, interesting classes in historical methods for social study classes where they've used our archival images, which the students really love. They love to look at some of these old photographs. Um, these are particular, these particular photographs are from our school. So they really find it interesting to look at, at photographs of where they are now and that come from our past. And we've done all different kinds of projects with this particular class, um, but this one was uh, involved old photographs. This is a libguide. So depending on what the faculty want, we can develop these types of libguides that give the students um, really ready access to material that is uh, primary source material that is either within the archives or online. And here are some students actually in the researcher room looking at some of these um, online uh, resources. And I mean, I'm sorry, the analog resources. Um, another thing we really use, we really pull in with this particular class and other classes as well, are some of our scrapbooks. We've got some great scrapbooks um, from the early years of the college. We were um, we opened our doors in 1892, and we've got we've got over 350 scrapbooks, and most of them are digitized. And we've really enjoyed working with them, and our students love them. And the great part is that we can kind of use them in combination with both bringing them in to look at them physically and then the students can also go home and look at them um, online as well. And so we've had some great experiences with that. And Stacey, I think you've looked at, you've used um, these scrapbooks with some of your classes as well. Yeah, so students absolutely love scrapbooks. Um, it, everyone loves scrapbooks, I think, though they can be a bit difficult for us to handle. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually had a class uh, with Maria Sanchez's uh, Spanish, not Maria Sanchez, I'm sorry, I'm looking at your name, uh, Carmen Sotomayor's um, class. It was a 300 level Spanish class. We had a set of scrapbooks from Ramiro Lagos, a poet who's a faculty member here, and we wanted to be able to provide access to these in Spanish. So we wanted metadata in Spanish. And as a uh, continual class project, we worked with her class uh, to develop the metadata. Her class actually created the descriptions of those scrapbooks so that we could incorporate that into our digital collections. And it was really interesting. We, we had um, some feedback from students after some of these scrapbook classes and they, but, uh, they all commented on how important it was for them to actually get their hands on some of this physical material. They, they really enjoyed having the, um, the online scrapbooks available as well. Um, we teach surprisingly a lot of art classes that love to come to the archives and um, incorporate some of our physical items and online items too into their class projects. Uh, these are a couple of great uh, items on the left. They've used the McKeever death mask and some of his writings to, uh, to create something completely different. And on the right, they've used a photograph of, um, a, of one of our professors to do something different too. So a lot of different art projects. Here's Digital Darkroom also that has brought, that, that we kind of do a, a combination of a photography class and they use different aspects of um, just different photographs or some things that they would have to repair to do all kinds of really interesting things. Um, and we uh, use a lot of these in different exhibits around the library. On the right, you see one that we have up, I think it may still be up, where, they came, where the students came in and used a lot of our material and created zines. We also do um, a TED class for 360 for teachers education, and we, um, we kind of work with this to uh, around the Woolworth sit-ins. We've got a lot of great civil rights material, and this is always a really kind of a popular theme because it is something that was really important that happened in our city. So y'all are familiar with the story of the Woolworth sit-ins where this, these four gentlemen um, from A&T went into the Woolworths in February of 1960 and sat down and began the Woolworth sit-ins. But the interesting part for our students often is that we had 
college, we had some of our students participate in the sit-ins as well. These four students that you see here. And there's a lot of, inf we have a lot of great information on this. And they're very, very invested in this story. These three young women went down to the sit-ins. Um, they all have oral histories of this experience. And to talk about this um, and to, to give them the primary sources, they come into class, they hear the story, they sit down with the primary sources, whether it's newspaper articles, Articles, um, you know, whether it's letters, and they really get information, great information about this. These girls really got into big trouble for their participation. And one of the reasons that they were they were um, spotted and acknowledged is because they were wearing their class jackets. At the time, the students that were going here, it was a woman's college, they were all they all wore class jackets with a big old patch that said WC Women's College and a Minerva head. So they were spotted right away. And this is one of the reasons why they got in a lot of trouble. And um, so it's great to have a class jacket there when they come in, they can actually see it. They can learn about different perspectives with primary sources. Um, they can, talk, they can um, read what the chancellor said um, on February 9th, he gave a speech about it. They can see actual articles about um, what happened. They can read the, um, the kind of the testimony of the manager of Woolworths at the time. We've got his records, Curly Harris. They can read letters from the some of these girls' parents who were shocked that, that you know, they were ra ra they raised these very progressive, you know, um, young women who were taught to stand up what they believe and what they believed, and then they were about to get kicked out of school. Um, they can they can read the oral histories of these students who, um, you know, who felt very strongly about it and who couldn't believe that they were being treated like this after they they stood up for for um, their, you know you know, the, the, the people in um, who they thought they were doing the right thing. So it's really interesting to bring different perspectives to these students and have them um, have a really hands on experience with these primary sources. And then we do have opportunities for assessment. We have our own assessment sheets, but we, are, you know, we have worked very closely with faculty to also work in whatever kind of assessment um, that they would like to do as well. So that, there are several assessment sheets. This is kind of a rubric that we've worked with um, that's very successful for different, um, just kind of different levels of whatever, you know, whatever class is brought in. Now I am going to hand it off to Stacy, and she's going to talk about online sources. All right. So we have all of these wonderful resources. You want me to stop sharing, Stacey? Uh, yes, please. Okay. And um, I'm going to show you how to find them. So let me start sharing my screen. Okay, are you all seeing the library home screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so you can access all of our online resources as well as our special collections uh, and, and university archives page off of this home page by going to the libraries and collections. You can go directly to our digitized collections or go to our departmental page here, which provides access to finding aids. Part of what we do when we're teaching classes is we're educating students how archival research is a lot different from regular library research. And you're not going to be able to enter in um, just a keyword uh, and expect to find everything or material is going to be organized in a different way. Not everything is digital. And there's some very good reasons for that. You can see our current holdings for our archival collections, which includes our university archives, our manuscript collection, and the sheet music of our cello music collection and our women veterans collection here. Rare books is actually cataloged, so you can find those through our library catalog. Um, I'm not going to go too in depth with this, but this is our finding aid platform. So this is how you would access and find material in our archival collections. You can do a simple keyword search um, to find material, but it can be a bit tricky. Um, I'm going to search for Michael Parker's collection. Um, and because we do a, a huge amount of classes, a huge number of classes for the English department, both material that is in rare books, but also uh, working with the manuscript material in our collection, we focus on collecting on North Carolina authors, especially uh, the 
graduates of our MFA in uh, creative writing program. So we have a lot of students who will come in in classes to look at what a writer's collection looks like or learn how to do historic research for their own writing, such as po uh, the class in popular, uh, popular nonfiction. So this is an example of uh, what a finding aid looks like. It's going to give you uh, some administrative information about who it belongs to and the size of the collection. Michael's collection is a very large collection. So we usually only get out portions of it for um, classes, but you can see it's going to go through in an inventory um, to describe the contents of the collection so that you know to say, I want this box or this folder and students are able to figure out how to navigate how archives organizes material. Um, this, uh, this platform does have some digital content linked out to it, but it, I find that it's much easier just to go to our online collections. This is Gateway, the platform for our online collections. The material is divided up uh, roughly by our curatorial areas. Uh, and as you can imagine, our university archives is huge. It goes back to when we were chartered in 1891. So if you're looking for information on teaching education, or um, women in education, we are a phenomenal source for that. And a lot of our, uh, a lot, we have a great deal of our university records that are digitized. Here are a few of our most recent projects. We've been focusing a great deal on social movements in Greensboro and local history is one of our um, focuses in the manuscripts collection. So we have a project on LGBTQ history. We had a, have a project documenting the Black Lives Matter movement in Greensboro. Um, I'm going to give you a quick example of how to navigate. This is Civil Rights Greensboro, and it was created several years ago as complementing historian William Chase. Um, uh, book on the civil rights group movement in Greensboro. And it's actually a project that combined multiple institutions in this area into a single database with primary source resources. So that way uh, we have this phenomenal database of, of primary sources relating to civil rights in Greensboro. It also includes subject essays. Um, so that way people can get some background on civil rights in Greensboro and how it reflects on the national level. We also have some lesson plans and um, a timeline and map. If you scroll on every single page on the right side, you're gonna be able to navigate in several ways. You can navigate by item format, by topic, by the collection location. So you can see um, some of the additional tags that include the, um, the institution of origin as well as topic. You can go by decade as well. Um, you can see we have a very, very wide variety of formats contained with our in our collection. And this is great because students have a really great interactive experience and thinking about history in a way they aren't accustomed to. They're not accustomed to looking at a textile or an object, a typewriter, and thinking of it as a historic artifact, but it is. Um, to navigate material in this collection, um, this is a new platform. So if you find a little few quirks, let us know. So uh, this is a, a postcard, an anonymous postcard card, and you can tell if it's anonymous and looks like this, this is gonna be good. Um, and it's from, it was sent to our chancellor right after the sit-ins when our, it was a, became aware that our students actually were going to be sit-ins as Kathleen demonstrated to you. Um, if you scroll down and press on details, you're going to get a little bit more information, including the date, the institution holding the material, the collection. Uh, so you could actually come into our archives. This is part of our physical, our university archives. You could come in and physically look at it. You can expand out where you can really see the texture and with some of our illuminated manuscripts or more artistic uh, pieces in our collection. This is really important. And I just love that you can see this is a support your mental health association stamp when you look at the contents of this, <laughs> um, just the irony there. So um, this is a piece of hate mail that uh, was sent to our chancellor because the person was absolutely astonished and revolted by our students participating in the sit-ins. Um, but what the reason I'm showing you this is 
I don't find this handwriting very difficult to read, but we have noticed among our students, uh, real they're really challenged by reading cursive or certain types of handwriting. So we do assess uh, material we put out on our table to make certain it's something that the students are going to be able to interact with, but that's also challenging. So we're always going to, uh, for the most part, focus on material that is English, although we have multilingual um, collections. Uh, we also tried to make certain we at least can read the material we put out. Um, we make certain that if um, we know we're putting out material that is potentially offensive, which certainly uh, when you're looking at the historic record is, is a very strong possibility. We like to give our students warnings that there may be content they may be shocked by. So we do a lot of preparation in terms of just the content of the material. In addition to your typical personal papers, correspondence, photographs, we have photos of textiles, we also have a lot of um, oral histories. And I'm just doing a search up here. You can search within collections or through all collections. We have oral histories that are just transcripts. We have just audio or transcripts and audio and video and transcripts. We're trying to do more video now, but in the past we didn't have that ability. So what is wonderful about our oral histories is we actually have them indexed so you can go directly to the area you might be most interested in and um, see a synopsis and actually play a segment for that. Students. So well, no, I have. Uh, there's the, a number of the students that I we use these oral histories heavily in our classes. We have a lot of long term projects th through the semester that use our oral histories, and the students really love uh, hearing about those personal uh, experiences. And oral histories span across all of our collections. So we have them in university archives, we have them in women vets, and we have them in our manuscripts collection. I think I have like one minute left. So uh, just to push in, does anyone have any questions? There's none in the chat, um, but you can, you know, take your time to finish. Um, and I'll start dropping some links to, you know, the future webinars and assessments and stuff, but y'all y'all wrap up and do okay. your thing. All right. So we have transitioned many of our classes to online, to Zoom. Uh, given COVID, and we have been um, leaning on our, our digital collections very heavily. So if you are teaching an in-person class this semester, we are trying to limit the number of students to 25 students. How old are some of the photographs in our collection? We do have daguerreotypes, but Kathleen, do you want to speak to that since you teach that photography class? Sure, we do. Yes, a lot of our photographs that we use um, are from our archival collection. So those relate to our university. Um, so a, a, we have a, a lot of them that are, are turn of the century. So around, you know, the late 1800s um, and, you know, then through through the late 1900s. But we do have daguerreotypes, we have embryo types, we have a lot of those. We have a lot of, um, the students really enjoy seeing um, our collection of old cameras. So we have a lot of those as well. Yeah, the, the oldest item we have in our collection as a, a point of media is a, um, a token uh, that was used in Roman theaters from 100 AD. And the most recent will probably be something random that I get in the mail today. So <laughs> we, are, we have a very broad span of material within our collection. And that's important because we do teach about the development of the book, the development of print, the development of paper making um, free, very, very frequently. That's one of our areas of concentration. A lot of the students I think are amazed that we still, we're act, we actively collect. You know, I think they think that, you know, somehow our, our collecting stalled at some of these older things, but I mean, we do actively collect. Matter of fact, you want to talk about the, I love Amari, you're, you're doing an exhibit right now on Amari Brown. Right. So this was part of the, um, the Black Lives Matter project. So this was a project we started you know, in the midst of COVID. Um, we know we have to document uh, local 
history as it happens, uh, you know, it's history in the making. And uh, so we were actually actively going out and photographing and video recording and collecting for physical material. Um, but we also, the Black Lives Matter collection is a community curated collection in that um, we receive submissions from um, the local community, including video, um, uh, photographs that they were taking on their phone during the protest when they were walking down looking at Elm Street of um, of the events as they were happening. Anna is awesome. Just shout love out Anna. Yes, we love Anna. She's yes. the best. So um, we, I am actually in the middle, uh, hopefully it'll be up tomorrow, of putting up a um, an exhibit that will be by our reference, crap, our reference department that will be featuring material from the Black Lives Matter collection, including some of the photographs as well as some of the artifacts that are contained. Um, actually, this, this piece here is interesting. We have this piece in a collection. It was created by, um, by an artist in Winston-Salem for the United States of Racism Project. And it is a sheet. It's a mural on a sheet. The sheet uh, was owned by um, uh, a very famous civil rights leader. Uh, and uh, then the artist painted the mural on and hung it outside of the Winston-Salem detention facility where they were protesting what they felt was the uh, unfair imprisonment of a um, detainee in that facility. So uh, we were actively going out, meeting. It, it was very fun doing collecting during COVID, meeting in parks, meeting, you know, talking to people on their front porch. But we collected also three murals that were depicted downtown um, by artist Amari Brown, who is a local artist. They are very large, so I cannot put them on display in the cases that I am using, but they are available for research purposes if you walked into our special collections and university archives. Uh, and one of the items is Angela Davis. Um, which actually was inspired by the artist's mother because the, uh, the mother uh, knew the older civil rights leaders and was imparting that, uh, that those stories to her son, I think Amari's in his early 20s, um, as well as two other pieces, one featuring Black Panther and Storm. His art is very much influenced by comic book art. So you'll see pictures of some of those pieces in the exhibit. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for, for listening to us today. And if you would like to get in contact with us, um, to, and we're willing to be, definitely if you think we can fit into your class or you're not certain, mm -hmm. it's better to reach out to us. I'm gonna put my email in the chat for you. But mine as well, or you can just SCUA. yeah, or you can just contact us on our school account. Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to see if we can incorporate into your class. Um, if you be certain to ask us, um, we we we're very very flexible, and I don't think we've had a class we've had to turn away because we couldn't come up with content. Yes, we're very inventive. We, we like this the best. <laughs> And Monique said, thank you. This was a great introduction to the archives. Oh, thank um, you. Oh, thanks so much, Monique. We look forward to hearing from you. He's a new you. instructor at UNCG. So that's great. Yeah, come so see us. Yes. I dropped a lot of stuff in the chat. I'm not going to like make you all hear me repeat it. But just the basic context is that there is an assessment in there to let us quickly know how we did. And there are upcoming spring 2022 webinars on a variety of topics related to online learning and research and applications. Uh, so that webinar link, the uncg.libguides.com slash webinars link has all of our stuff. Um, again, past recordings and future um, sessions. Uh, so let us know if you have any questions about that. And um, yeah, any final questions as we as we wrap up? No, thank you all. This was really helpful. Maria, hey, good hi. to see you. Good to see you, Maria. <laughs> kind hey. of. I just realized I'm totally in the dark. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> better to see the screen. Nice shadowing. Nice. Yeah. Is that um, the fear? 
we only touched on a, we, I mean, it was the tiniest amount of material we have. Um, it was, it's, it was, as you can tell, we're used to talking a lot more about our collections. Yes. So do reach out to us um, and we'll, we'll, t we'll let you know if we, if we can fit into your class, we have a lot more than you, you probably think we do. <laughs> we have got something for everyone. We really do. We have got amazing collections and amazing staff. We have staff with so many, so much great expertise um, that we haven't even mentioned with that. So please reach out to us. We, we have got some great, great material and great staff just waiting to, to work with you. Yes, I second that. Thanks, okay, Sam. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, again, be on the lookout for a link to the recording. Um, if you have colleagues who um, maybe missed this recording or benefit from this recording, feel free to forward the email to them as well. And uh, thank you all. Have a great rest of your week. It's Thursday. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye, y'all.